Thomas. We apologize for coming a little late, but there's another meeting that uh, ran a little late this room. Uh, my name is Mike Jacobs. Uh, I'm a member of the Housing Advisory Board and the Brookline Housing Authority, and I'm also an affordable housing consultant. Uh, with me is Frank Caro, who uh, was one of the co-founders of the Brookline Community Aging Network, and Judy Allen, who's also a member, and that here is Fran Price, our housing planner. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Friendly Cities Initiative, which is a collaboration with the Board of Selectmen, uh, Council on Aging, and Brookline Can. Uh, I don't know how many of you were at our uh, last meeting, but we had a very good turnout, about 130 people, to discuss models of uh, human ser of, uh, se of senior housing. And uh, we had a pretty interesting discussion, and uh, throughout a lot of different models, both in terms of working with existing housing to looking at different types of new construction uh, models of senior housing. What we'd like to do tonight is to um, try and focus a little more on models that folks think make sense for Brooklyn and try and concretize this in a way that says if, if we have a strong advocacy for additional senior housing to try and figure out what we can do as a community to deal with some of the barriers we identify and uh, what we can do to encourage development in terms of working with the town, working with outside developers, changing zoning. Uh, so tonight we want to uh, first sort of summarize uh, the meeting last time for those of you who were not there, and then uh, begin getting into the models and try and narrow down what models folks would like to focus on. Um, so how many, how many of you were at uh, the last meeting? Um, then uh, I, I will try and be brief in terms of just uh, summarizing uh, the results of the April 7th meeting. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, we had a mixture of nonprofit, mostly nonprofit and for-profit developer exploring different models. And those models really range from working with existing housing in terms of conversion or adaptive reuse, uh, working with things such as accessory apartments, which was something proposed at town meeting a while back, but didn't get much support. Uh, and then a full range of different models, ranging from uh, straight senior age-restricted housing, either rental or ownership, to uh, housing with varying degrees of services, either service coordination, bringing in services from the outside, or delivering services within a particular apartment community, to independent living, which provides services within the building and some meals, to assisted living, which provides uh, help with personal care and assistance with daily living, to what they call CCRCs, Community Care Retirement Communities, that have independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing facilities all within that. Uh, each of those models have different opportunities and different constraints within the town. Uh, and uh, given the demographics of the town, we want to try and understand needs of those of us who uh, have hit the, the 50 or 60 plus uh, generation uh, and uh, talk through what some of these may be and how we can concretize that. Um, so any, any questions before we begin? Frank or Judy, do you want to? You know, I, you know, I should say last time we, you know, we had the, um, uh, you know, the perfect set of presentations and, uh, and, and, and the, the people who made the presentation provided us with a whole lot of information <coughs> very, very concisely. Um, and and then, then we had some discussion. And uh, the, the discussion was really very good. There were you know, people who came forward with some ideas that were different from um, you know, things that the, uh, that the presenters had uh, spoken about. And I think one of the things that we're interested in this evening is that some of you have some ideas. Um, you've had the opportunity to think about it. Um, at the last meeting, <coughs> I'm sorry, I might have said it on our side of the name. Um, did you talk about sort of service delivery models like things like Beacon Hill Village and things like that? We started from uh, the 
there was a spokesperson for Vandovic who talked about service delivery within the home. Uh, uh, one of the folks speaking, uh, an advocate uh, for Jewish community, who uh, used to work at Jewish community housing for the elderly, who works with Jewish community housing for the elderly in the Hebrew city of life, uh, also took a strong position that there are at least some studies that the quality of life and longevity is improved in senior housing. So we're not excluding any model whatsoever, and there's no one model fits all, clearly, for this community. Uh, and and, and uh, I should, should say that the Brookline Community Agency Network represents a Brookline effort to incorporate some of the main ideas of the community model. Right. Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I was just looking at the uh, slides from uh, Hebrew Single Life uh, a day or two ago, and uh, the striking thing about that presentation is that uh, they said that they own a contiguous uh, uh, group of, of properties, uh, uh, not just the existing buildings, but other property that could be developed into uh, large-scale senior housing, and that they are ready within a year, I believe the slide says, to uh, start uh, doing that if the zoning is uh, uh, changed so that they, they're allowed to. So of all the presentations that I recall, that sounds to me like it possibly the most concrete uh, uh, action item. And given uh, what I know of the high quality of what they do, uh, that's, that's uh, probably a really desirable thing to pursue. Maybe that should be the first item of uh, action items. I don't know how the zoning can be changed, but uh, some, I'm sure people here do. Well, I certainly think when at the last meeting, zoning was clearly one of the strongest barriers to, you know, to affordable housing, to multifamily <coughs> housing in town. Uh, and that's clearly something that I think as we move forward, looking at the zoning ordinances, looking at whether you need 2.3 cars, you know, for a three-bedroom unit, and things like that, uh, we have to address because it clearly raises the cost of development it, and it chills development greatly. And given the high cost of land, which is obviously another one of the barriers we face in Brookline to begin with, um, issues like that are. Yes, and the, uh, the uh, as far as I, didn't, I don't know that any other organization that presents it actually owns land so uh, currently. So. So they, they're not facing that barrier of the high cost of land. They're, they only have one barrier with the zoning. So uh, and that, you know, it's, it's obviously easier to change zoning laws than, than some deal with land costs. Well, so, 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 some of us can debate that. Right? Yeah, they have land in Brooklyn. Yeah. It's on they, only they, have, they, own, they own the land they between own. their two properties uh, on oh. Center Street. 100 Center Street and 100 Center. They own those, but do they, they own? There's a, uh, oh, an old single family know. home in between the two on Center Street. Which between they own. the two, I understand. But, but that also raises an issue. People say there's no land in Brookline. And, uh, you know, um, Ed Zucker, who just bought the Waldo Street garage, would differ with you. The folks who uh, converted gas stations into housing would differ with you, and you've seen your life. So, I mean, there are opportunities, and uh, I don't want to focus also just on new constructions. I think there are those folks in this room who also would like to talk about things like accessory apartments, which are have maybe fewer barriers. Um, and in terms of thinking about how we proceed, you know, it may be in terms of uh, the fewest barriers to the most barriers. Uh, there, there are different ways to think about it. I want everyone's help in terms of how to structure this. You raised an issue about, you know, this is the most concrete. Uh, example, and that's one way to do this. But I also want to not limit the discussion in terms of one model, because one, we don't know what they're proposing. Um, yes, ma'am. And then also, um, the other thing um, would be to a, review the de demographics as they exist today for the population that's over um, 60 plus that exists for applying what it's going to look like 10 years from now, and to really focus on the needs of that population as to what they really want rather than speculate. And most of us, these the two of us here, and the gentleman next to me is a research expert on the topic, um, did some research um, in the library recently, uh, 38 page report from MetLife, um, 
um, that indicates most people want to age in place in their own homes. So how can we work with the town to make that a possibility rather than creating other areas for people to move out of their homes, sell their homes? What can yeah. we do to focus on that if that's the need of the majority? So, you know, I mean, we could just talk about all kinds of possibilities without doing further research on the existing aging population, work planning, doing a needs assessment. We could throw all kinds of ideas up there. But my idea would be to try to do some, reach out to the elderly and say, what do you need? What do you want? Again, that may be the model in terms of the fewest barriers, given the barriers we talked about at the last time, that goes high on the list. But also, we have to make distinctions between preference and need. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's need-based housing. Uh, some of the senior housing is simply lifestyle-oriented. I think the gentleman who spoke on uh, active adult condominiums, people are making lifestyle choices. Uh, if you're going into assisted living, it may not be your first choice, but it's a need-based choice. So I think we really have to, it's, it's both a preference issue and a need issue, and I think getting at the need issue is, is challenging. You're certainly right in terms of the demographics, there's a study that just came out in the town which showed, I think, a tremendous increase in the 55 to 64 age group. Close 40% increase in a decade, and that's not just a Brookline phenomenon. That's, that's all over. It's an aging and generation. So it's a tremendous uh, demographic pressure uh, to, that's ahead of us to accommodate that population. And you know, we also have to understand this is a very diverse population, diverse in its preferences, diverse in its health status, diverse in its uh, socioeconomic status. And, and um, uh, people have different, different preferences, and so uh, we're going to need a diversity of op options to accommodate this population. Is there a shortage of non-home residents subsidized housing, uh, which is senior-oriented. Uh, we have the Hebrew Senior Life. We have two assisted living properties. But, you know, to the best of my knowledge, at least the senior housing is, I don't believe there are large vacancies in those. Uh, and again, that's with the current demographics, which are, which, which are shifting. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here to begin with. What, what this whole thing going? Um, there, there was a session uh, in the beginning of April to discuss different models. But I mean, what about that going? Well, this is part of the you know, Age Friendly Cities Initiative mm -hmm. um, that's looking comprehensively at, uh, mm -hmm. at, at the needs of older people in, uh, uh, in Brookline. And, and part of, part of that uh, initiative <coughs> Yeah, housing. If you you, um, you 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 ask older people, well, what are what are the uh, most important issues for them? And you know, this is kind of asking um, you know older people very broadly. You know, they, they, the the four things that are at the top of their their list are health, uh, finances, housing, and transportation. So. Housing is just a key issue for older people. And if you're going to talk broadly about addressing needs of a growing older population, housing has to be on the table. What I got from that meeting in April is that there's very little for middle class that if you're needing for some housing, and if you're very wealthy, you can have some housing. But there seems to be a whole middle. Right. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about assisted living, 
right. No, that's, cer that's certainly true with assisted living. If you don't have uh, an insurance program that, that covers that, it's a real problem. Right. 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 Well, well, clearly, affordability is a critical question. Uh, assisted living that we had more mixed income and assisted living back in the 90s when the state had a Medicaid, still has a Medicaid program that will fund a uh, group called Group Adult Foster Care, which when it was uh, active in the early 90s when we started seeing assisted living coming into this community, the difference between what that paid along with some other subsidies, which was about $2,2100, and the market at that time, which was $2,700 to $3,000, the gap wasn't that great. <clears throat> now that, that it's still $2,100, $2,200, and assisted living is five and $6,000. So there's really no incentive for private developers to do mixed income housing and the state in terms of, we talk about 40B, and uh, there's no incentive uh, for anyone to even do a 40B assisted living because the state will only count the housing component and not recognize the services. So a developer would be charging $1,000 for a product that might cost $3,000 and there's no economic sense to it. Uh, so communities really can't use that option for any housing with services. Uh, it sort of rules that out if you said, gee, there's an there's a alternative to zoning without going through the whole process of changing the zoning. Uh, that's really not open to communities, at least right now, given the state policy. But, you know, it sort of raises sort of the main barriers we talked about and just sort of the highlight. Uh, one was lack, lack of funding. Uh, how do you deal, you know, and there are funding programs for for low income. Uh, it's hard to find those, those funding programs for middle income. There are programs that go up to 80% of area median income, but not 100%, 120%. Uh, um, scarcity of land, which we've talked about. Uh, zoning, which I think is a real big one. And just the whole public process uh, that one has to go through. So those, those were sort of the main areas that folks came up with. Uh, so let me summarize in terms of going on. It seems to me we, we, we talked about a couple uh, models at sort of the low end of the scale in terms of barriers. Uh, one is service delivery and how you keep folks in their home. And uh, the other is focusing on folks who have land right now who could provide senior housing. And that could be keeper senior life. It could be uh, it's Zucker in the Waldo Street garage. We don't know what he's developing either at this point. Um, uh, yes. uh, on the uh, North Brookline uh, Neighborhood Association list, after the last meeting, there was all this buzz about the uh, neighborhood's infamous Dexter Park, and uh, which is a rental building. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my curiosity is approaching owners of rental buildings about turning them into senior housing, which um, with Dexter Park, it, the neighborhood would be delighted uh, to be rid of all the new students who are in the building. And um, I mean, I think that's an interesting concept. There are a lot of rental buildings around. And you know, the Chestnut Hill people are professional rental building operators. There's one right on Beacon Street, Beacon in St. Paul, where the Buddha restaurant is. Uh, that, you know, and those are right on transportation. How, how the town can approach those kind of developers. But they also talked about, at the last meeting, about taking some of the buildings by eminent domain holder. Someone got up to talk about it. They talked about Hancock Village and as much as some people dream about that, that's they really not something I, I that's, that's uh, going to happen. When I left, one of the thoughts that came into my mind, which I mentioned to Frank before the meeting, was that an urban land is worth a lot more higher than wider. So if you're going out into the suburbs, you need a lot of land. But in an area like Brookline, you need to just build up higher because the land costs and, and you don't need as many facilities as they have out in the cities. We have a lot of things right here. So 
In response to, to Carol's comment about Dexter Park or any right. other apartment yeah. building that people love in the town, uh, you know, the issue is just a straight economic issue. If, if a developer feels he, is, he can do better on cash flow and, and profit, it, it's something they'll consider. Uh, I know one of the things that, that someone has said to me about that, that <coughs> I, I, I've talked with Harold Brown about Dexter Park for a number of years now, and it's one of the things is with students, they have a one-year lease. And so at the end of the year, they can raise their rent to whatever, you know, there's a, but if you have somebody who is older and has a two or three year lease, you can raise your rent every year, but only a much smaller proportion. And uh, so the profit motive for them is, uh, even though, you know, they have to redo the apartments every year. There's someone in the back for the... Oh, I was just gonna just respond to what Carol just said that, I mean, that's an interesting idea, but it's not a way to remove the students. They're going to be living in other housing right in the neighborhood. They're not going away, which is going to have an impact on, on the pricing yeah. in, I'm in the neighborhood. In I'm interested in Dexter Park okay. and places like that because there's an elevator. Okay? Yeah, oh, it's I, all accessible. You know, it's handicapped and accessible. There's uh, two different tees to choose from. It's, yes. No, I understand yeah. that, but just what I think you said that, you know, the, the, neighbors, neighbors, the neighbors would love it. It doesn't solve the problem, and it just in terms of thinking through the consequences of some of these things, that that that's one of them. The, the students will still be there, and it will impact the um, the rental prices in, in nearby housing. But combining your comment and your comment, it seems to me, looking, we have a lot of naturally occurring retirement communities yes. here in the elevator buildings right mm -hmm. now. And it seems to me, if you think about economies of scale in terms of delivering services and creating a network, those are those are buildings you should you should target in terms of we move ahead with a group that's looking at service delivery. It seems to me that's the perfect. If you have a personal care aid with several folks on the floor, the cost can be much more effective for folks than going between buildings. So I think in terms of a model, like clearly that's one we should we should focus on. Yes. And, um, I'm a resident of Brookline and also the community life coordinator at Center of Communities. And I um, have been struck by what an asset Center of Communities is in the three buildings, 1550, 112, and 100, in terms of being able to have mixed income housing, everything from completely subsidized to market rate, um, being able to offer a medical practice in the building, being able to have the senior center and all of its, um, all of its vast resources right right behind us as neighbors. Um, and one thing I notice is that we have many people living there that come from Brookline, but also a lot of people who move there because they're adult children who are trying to work and raise families and take care of their, their parents in a way with the medical care here and everything. This is a, an ideal situation because their parents are able to move from California, New York, wherever, and be close to them, have their independence. The adult children who are living and paying taxes and so forth in Brooklyn as well, they are comforted and so it's serving not just one generation, but the, the whole age span, down to the grandchildren because they're able to have their grandparents living in community with them. So I am excited as someone who lives here and also as somebody who works for Hebrew Senior Life to see what can be done. I've been very excited uh, with this idea of all the supportive services that are in place and the ability for people to have as much or as little as they want. And um, so we're lucky to have this at Brooklyn. I'm really grateful that Mr. Stern made that wise decision to sell <laughs> to Hebrew <laughs> Senior Life. He was a
the zoning issue. Zoning, but they can't do that, so they want to sell the whole property. Um, anybody pushing a developer and saying this is an ideal place? There are at least 15 to developers interested in that site. zoning issues, uh, because we're talking about, you know, we're talking about service delivery in homes, we're talking about conversion of existing housing, and then we're talking about some new construction opportunities as well, those are sort of, uh, I think, the spectrum. And again, within the existing housing, and I see Roger Blood in the background, uh, we, we can't forget accessory units, which, uh, I don't know, Roger, you want to mention anything? Say again? Do you want to mention anything about that option? Well, I see it's up there, second on the, on the list. It was uh, it, it came up at the end of the forum uh, after the, the developer and senior uh, people senior life uh, presentations, and um, as, as many people may know, there was a, a quite an undertaking. Uh, the housing advisory board, Grand Price, as the housing division, and myself uh, worked quite a while to develop a, uh, a zoning bylaw to to allow us. Uh, single-family homes, primarily single-family homes, um, a little more latitude to create accessory <coughs> dwelling units in their house, which would be small, uh, small size, very tightly defined, but separate dwelling units. And, and a dwelling unit is a, is a term of art in zoning that um, includes uh, living space, a, a separate bath, bath space, and a kitchen, including a cooking facility. Um, uh, irrespective of the, the rest of the size, but it's suitable for any kind of a little separate household in a, in a single family house, but obviously could meet a lot of needs for seniors aging in place uh, through various stages of aging in place from whether you saw an empty nester couple or a widow or a widower uh, in, in a home they could downsize from the large part of the house to the smaller part, they can have a companion or a caregiver, uh, someone to even help, help pay the taxes and the maintenance, all kinds of possibilities. Um, there were a lot of interest groups uh, that wanted the thing constricted and changed this way and that way and make it, it ended up being quite restrictive. And then it came, zoning changes in town, it, it, we, it's easy to talk about getting them done, and, but it's, it's a high threshold. It's a two-thirds vote in a town meeting with a lot of different interests and personalities. And this particular measure, uh, after it went through every single board and committee that needed to say they liked it, without any serious uh, uh, opposition or objections, fell about four votes short in town meeting of the, the two-thirds of the 240 people there. And um, a friend and I and, and several others have been meeting uh, recently, since this housing forum in April, actually, after getting some encouragement to at least take another look. But we're taking a little bit different, at least initially at this point, a little different approach, remembering what, a, what an awful effort it was and, and uh, to, to get over the zoning hurdle. And this time, at least now, we're... Um, we're examining with the building commissioner and the, the uh, health uh, the health officer um, and the, the chief planner and, and, and Fran and myself from the housing advisory board exactly what the existing zoning allows and doesn't allow. And um, they're really and we're going to come out with a, a, a brief, clear document uh, sometime soon for, for people to see and, and contemplate um, that maybe there's more things that can be done now to meet a lot of the needs of, of, of seniors who are aging in place than they might realize. Uh, because um, you can, for example, have um, extended uh, families of all kinds, sizes and shapes and numbers and generations living in one home, um, and even in some instances have a, sec a, sec a second full kitchen as long as it's not a separately locked and defined uh, dwelling unit. And there are many other configurations 
uh, which are limited uh, only by not having a, a full cooking stove, but a microwave and everything else you think of in a kitchen that can be put in a single family house and, and they need to pass various uh, health inspection rules, but don't run afoul of, uh, of zoning. So what we're going to come out with, and we're just getting the drafting form now, having had several meetings since April, is this document which will first outline as clearly as possible what we think the needs and wants of seniors are that from a single family, mainly single family home perspective, and then the things that can be done in the existing bylaw to meet those needs. Uh, they, might, they might require permits or approvals of different sorts, but not a zoning change. And then last and thirdly, uh, the specific things that you can't do that you might be thinking of that would go over the line. And uh, when we do that, it'll have the, uh, the um, you know, the understanding from the building and health officials in town that um, this is something that's appropriate to communicate to everybody. Sally? Are you going to put the graining pods in? The uh, accessory dwellings that are on the property, but they're not necessarily connected to the house. There, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's um, that there is the, the current zoning bylaw, it, oddly enough, allows accessory units in, in a true form as a unit um, if they're in a separate building. So <laughs> but not, but not, if they're, not, not if they're an existing home, no matter how large. But yes. only if they're used by the, the, yeah. the employees of the house and their, and their families. So if you have domestic employees, and then it says for you that you begin there with your mother. So not about your mother, unless you hire her. Good point. Yes. Is, it, yeah. is it tacky to ask whether anybody ever considers running for town meeting member against people who don't like accessory units? Okay, I don't know if you will be running against me. I'm okay. telling you. <laughs> Just ask it, and let me tell you what the argument was in town meeting then, since you're going to vote against me. And that's what we believe would happen once the people left the home for some reason. What happens now to that accessory unit? And will that help elderly in the long run? Because you have a large built house, and you now have an accessory unit. And when that elderly person leaves for some reason, who's going to buy it? And what are they going to do with the accessory unit? Is that usually it's a family with children. Now Roger has told me that, that it's going to be very vague so that if somebody wants it, like for a nanny or something, then they could use it. Am I correct in saying this? Well, when you say what I told you it's going to be, all we're going to do now is interpret clearly with the, with the understanding of the various town officials what's permissible. R right now we're not contemplating writing another zoning article. Because the, the problem was if you wanted to help elderly people and seniors, how many generations is this going to help? Is it going to help just the people who are living there? Because the next group of people that move into that house might be a family with young children and no seniors. So that was a question. How do you how do you help seniors continuously and not just for that one group that you're building the accessory? The, the, the opposition, you're, you're correct, uh, the, the opposition felt like it was a backdoor route towards converting a single-family zoning district into a two-family district. Mm -hmm. But that, and, I think there was more to that than... I, I don't think doing. we should debate. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we should debate this. You two Sorry, Roger. Take it outside, you two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you can vote against me. I'll still vote against me. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Joanna Baker. I'm a relatively new member of town meeting. I'm in my second uh, term, two years. And I just want to follow up on what we said to people think about running for town meeting. Please run for town meeting. Yes. Please run for select person. Right. Please oppose people so that we don't have people running for re-election uncontested. People begin to think that these are their inheritance, these seats. And you know what? You need to have another generation who understand what goes on in Brookline in the history. So please run, not to go against or for any position, but just for new blood. Please. Been there, done that. Two, two things. Um, one of the ideas of how to run tonight's meeting and what we want to do at the end is to go back through these ideas once we've got them all spun out on here and give you an opportunity to weigh in on what, what ones you think are priorities, what ones you think are most doable, um, and begin to think about strategies for how to approach those and, and to 
hopefully you'll all sign up to be on our committee to help make some of those things happen. So this is not the place to talk about whether it will work or won't work so much as if there's going to be a lot of interest in accessory apartments, then all the people who are interested will vote for it when we get to it and sign up to be on the committee that works on it. One more thing, totally separate. Um, the question of incentives came up with this, with Evie. Um, and it occurred to me also when we were talking about the existing rentals to make, to give them, you know, to help get the owners to dedicate some of them to seniors. Um, there may be other kinds of incentives besides within the zoning bylaw. I'm not quite sure where to put that, but I'm going to write incentives. I don't know what strategies, star strategy one, and I think incentives go to that. <laughs> I read a lot about rumor and senior housing, and I think it's really critical that Brookline has acknowledges all of these different trends because with the boomers aging out and um, the community needing to find better solutions, you've got multi generational housing, which is a huge trend. You've got these um, accessory apartments that you can take out. They're very sophisticated. Um, they're, you know, they've got a lot of technology in them. Well, when you're done with them, you can get rid of them. They're portable. Um, you've got all kinds of different models that, that Brookline has got to have zoning in place for, or at least be thinking about it. Because these are these are trends that in other parts of the country are very very common. We've been talked a lot about sort of services, and we've talked a lot about existing buildings, but we haven't really talked a lot about new construction, about you know designing buildings that really are targeted mm -hmm. specifically for the population. Uh, you know, every senior life also was able to in the purchase of uh, those buildings. Uh, renovate them and create more community spaces to, you know, uh, but we already started off with the senior building to do that and it really lends itself. Uh, there's some buildings that are not going to convert easily and I don't want to sort of rule out the possibility of other models, whether you could have a smaller, you know, there was a group that came from Chicago who wanted to do, who does urban continuing care retirement communities. Well, we can't do a 40-story building, which is what they do in, in Chicago, but you know, looking at that model where you have, you know, it, it's the full spectrum of, of needs. From coming in at independent to uh, aging in place, and it's particularly great with a couple who one has greater needs than the other. Um, so I don't want to sort of rule out anything at this point. We, we know that all these are going to have cost constraints, are going to have, but these are being developed in other parts of the country in places with high land prices, in places with scarce land. So I don't want to sort of be defeatist and say, oh, it's tough. We know it's <coughs> tough. Uh, if we think these are important models, we should explore the approaches to incentivize the town and developers to bring that in. Yes, sir? I have a question about zoning. I know we um, basically nothing about Brooklyn zoning, but um, uh, if, if from what I just heard, um, in order to change a zoning law, uh, you need a uh, two-thirds town meeting vote. But if, other than changing the law, is there a facility for a variance that does not require two-thirds town meeting vote? I can answer that question. In order to obtain a variance, the parcel has to be special and peculiar um, and uh, um, consistent with the neighborhood and not impose any additional burden. If the stand standards are literally applied, almost nothing can qualify for a variance. Occasionally, the Board of Appeal will grant a variance as a matter of discretion, and if it's not appealed for in 30 days, then it locks in. And it's very difficult to obtain. Nor can you zone through town meeting action a particular parcel. That's known as spot zoning in the sense that can't be differentiated from the surrounding uh, zone. So zoning is um, uh, is 
meant to be a broad scheme for the time, and it's hard to change lot by lot. Not, never mind. It's, it's, you cannot change it lot by lot. You can do overlay districts, though, for example. Yes. If you, if you say, here's an area with high services and good transportation, <coughs> you can create an overlay district. Uh, so I don't claim to be a zoning expert, but there are creative ways uh, to not spot zone. Why is Brookline so far behind? I moved up to Brookline a number of years back and thinking that it was an urban area right adjacent to Boston with all the medical hospitals and top universities. And I'm sitting here and from a few experiences around town, I'm very disappointed that Brookline isn't doing anything for seniors. Why? Is it a problem between zoning, between everything, that there's no precedence for seniors when the senior population is growing? Um, this is an educated urban area. And um, in Chicago, they're doing things in different areas. Why is well, that? Well, that's, that's, that, you know, that, that's why we're never having this discussion. I, you know, and I say, you know, one of the ironies here is that uh, seniors are very well represented in town meeting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Carol did some analysis a few years ago and found that the median age of town meeting members was 60. Mm -hmm. uh, but but, up. but as, a, <laughs> uh, as, a, as a community, uh, we have not been focused on, on senior needs. Uh, the, the town went through a comprehensive planning process uh, uh, some years ago, there was uh, no attention to special populations at all. Um, and and uh, it is timely uh, for the town to have this, have this discussion, uh, you know, because seniors do represent a substantial part of the town. They do have special can. needs, and it is a growing population. I think that was wonderful that BCAN came into existence. We need some more. I know. That's why I'm giving you credit. We need some more advocacy for seniors and uh, to help them. Right. Yes. Yes, I, I just wanted to respond to this woman's presentation is that I think the key word that she used was urban. And most people in Brookline really deny that we are an urban community. <laughs> I mean, if you if you see that you know there, the things you can where you can park and you can't park, there's over, no overnight parking on streets, and I mean we are an urban part of Brookline is extremely urban, and right. the rest of it is not, and so there's this conflict of how you. Yeah. I, I think another part of the answer to the question is where uh, even though we are urban, we're a, a, it's an oxymoron, but we're a town, and the town form of government. Including town meeting, gives neighborhoods a, a great deal more power relative to the central government of the of the town or city than it would be the case of a city like Boston or Cambridge. And so the neighbor, neighborhood interests are not necessarily anti-senior, but they tend to be anti-development. That's a great point. The, the city of Watertown, you know, it's called Watertown. Yeah. Um, I mean, the town hasn't done nothing. You're right. I mean, uh, for Heber Senior Life, the town put a million dollars into Heber Senior Life to make that an increased affordability. Actually, that more because we uh, we negotiated our tax agreements interest is worth a lot more than a million dollars. I think that you know, most of the senior housing in uh, in Brooklyn, like everywhere in the country, you know, was built in the uh, 70s. 70s and 80s because the, the federal government has basically decimated the uh, housing programs in the, uh, in the 80s. So the, the, ma the, the major housing developments throughout the country, throughout the Commonwealth, and throughout the nation are all 30 to 40 years old. Um, so yes, there are some, you know, certainly some new uh, urban developments happening elsewhere, but um, but. That's why the land costs here are so high, because even though, um, you know, they say it's mixed, it's not all urban, but land costs in this area are particularly high because it's still somewhat urban, even though, because it's adjacent to Boston. And that's why uh, 
apartments is so much in demand, and that's why the rentals are so high. Um, in the back there. No, uh, in terms of, of why the town did not put things into place any sooner, I was always struck, coming from a different country, at the amount of people, seniors, who assumed that they would go and retire elsewhere. I know my, my relatives, my husband's parents did so, and I think the, 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 the staying in place, the aging where you have been, it's really of the past 10 years that I see that happening. Yes. And the other part uh, is that within this town, I think we've always been very careful to balance the needs of all the populations, the kids and the schools that they need, the students and you know the kind of roping in that they may need but uh, you know, to, to keep them on the straight and narrow path. But I think we, we, we are trying very hard, have always been trying very hard, to meet everybody's needs. And I think the senior piece, um, once the senior center came, that was really the first start that, that everybody said, oh, okay, you know, we're going to stay here, and it got very exciting uh, for seniors to stay. But before that, boy, people were out on the cake. They went down uh, to play golf in warmer climes and what have you. So it, it was very different. Well, I've been here for 40 years, and I, I, I know for 30 of those 40 years, I saw people leave. Right. Unless they were town meeting members. <laughs> <laughs> we, we even had some selectmen that went to Florida. Yeah, yeah, they all did. Yeah. Not while they were serving. But no. <laughs> Mike, um, isn't there kind of two different models? I don't know if you probably know more about this uh, of, of senior housing for new housing, the, the so called 55 and over, and then the pure senior housing. I, I know that. Um, when Chestnut Hill Realty was proposing to redevelop uh, a really large scale, hundreds yes. of units in, in Hancock Village, um, they were willing to talk about over 55 housing. And um, the, the, the town and the, and the neighborhood didn't want to consider that. They would have talked about it, the neighbors all senior, pure housing, but were afraid that the over 55 <coughs> rules were too loose and was going to cause even though it was called senior housing, a lot of children in the already overcrowded school. So are there really two different models of well, possible? Well, I think the, the HUD model is 62. Yes. Um, but, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. There, there are a lot of 55 and older communities, and theoretically only one member of the household has mm -hmm. to be over 55. I don't know. There's a very, very, very small percentage of folks who move into those communities with kids. It's, it's you know, so... It's not. It's possible to happen, but I think if you look statewide, it'd be a very, very small percentage. The, the great fear here was that people looked at those statistics and, and they said Brookline is different. There's so much desire for people to get their kids in our boundaries into our system that they would they would crowd those units in effect. Well, I certainly think the uh, the private developer proposed age targeted housing would, would never fly here in Brookline because folks would say. You know, just families would move into that if there was no if there was no restriction. Yeah. Uh, so, so I do think that's a problem. Yes. this towards, towards where we go from here. And uh, I'm going to turn to Judy, because I don't know what she's been writing. Well, a whole page of ideas. I want to just be sure before we try to focus, which is Are there any ideas or models or opportunities that we did not put up here that should be up here before we try to prioritize this? You mentioned um, Waldo Street. Well, I'm just saying that's that's land that right now we don't know a use. 
So uh, it's not a model, it's just a fitting in terms of opportunities. What about co housing? Co housing is. Yeah, co housing is Yeah, co housing I was never thinking, I was a claustrophobic, I was never thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I just want to come, come right back to just one point in terms of this whole issue of school age population. And I think we touched upon it at the last meeting, which is you can build senior housing in a community, but you're still going to attract kids because folks are going to move out of their housing into the senior housing. It's called the echo effect. So it's mistaken for, for officials to think that, oh, you built senior housing, there's no impact on the schools. It, it's just not true. Yes? And perhaps this has been discussed, but what about mixed housing in the sense of housing above commercial use? Yes. Doesn't, doesn't that make more space available? Absolutely. Um, I visited a continuing care retirement community in Palo Alto, a place with very, very high land costs. And the other thing they did was folks didn't want to necessarily be isolated just with seniors. So they had restaurants and coffee shops so that the community could interact. And it worked beautifully. They put theater there for the whole community. So that type of model is, is fantastic. That's another, isn't that, you know, you think and all those single story commercial yes, buildings exactly. that have it's just you know, wasted. And, um, yeah. the, other, the other strip is the is the strip along Commonwealth Avenue, which people really forget that that is part of Brookline. And it's you know, starting at Sullivan Tire going all the way to Enterprise Car Rental is owned by one person who is a town meeting member here in Brookline. And um, yeah, those are single story buildings. And you know, Enough with the solid tire and the Firestone tire and the other tire. <laughs> well, BU doesn't have an option to purchase. It's certainly something to look into. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the Housing Board Act, Advisory Board actually did look at that a number of, of years back because it is an obvious, physically an opportunity. Yeah. Wash, Washington yeah. Square has a whole batch of buildings like that. Right. Yeah. St. Mary's uh, on Roller yeah. Street, yeah. and there's you know there's a history, period of history when that was done, and the the, the the main impediment is parking, and again it goes back to zoning. But I mean, all of those places. It, 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 it's right on the T. Yeah, I mean, on the T. still requires. The yeah. I mean, that, that was the main concern mm -hmm. at the time. Not, not that it can't be done, so if, if it's revisited, that's going to be mm -hmm. the hurdle that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of senior buildings where the parking is really for the employees more than the residents of right. the <laughs> in a lot of properties. So um, I'd like to add one thing to the affordability. We've talked about rental and we've talked a little bit about ownership, but there's an in between model, which is an entrance fee model, which I think also may address middle income folks, where if you're selling your home but you don't want to pay $5,000 a month, uh, there's a way you pay a portion of that which comes back to you or your heirs, mm -hmm. and your monthly payments are less. And I know, I think Rogers and House, uh, Jamie Siegel spoke about, it. that's a model he uses, so I don't want to sort of exclude that and talk about middle income mm -hmm. models. It's used a lot in community, continuing care retirement communities, but there's no reason it can't be explored for other models to combine that. It's a, an entrance fee model. Somebody mentioned microhousing a few moments ago. Yeah. That yeah. probably should be on that list. For, sure. yeah. uh, it, it's, it's I'll keep my prejudices away. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It could be microhousing with high ceilings.
to the ones that you think are most important or most doable.
It's, a, it's, the, it's the Cambridge, you want to explain the Cambridge voting level too? <laughs> what about the land area where the Mormon church was supposed to be? Again, uh, we don't have to find every land opportunity. I think if there's a group that's really interested in that, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do it that time, but absolutely. See, we've already come up with how many half a dozen sites in a place with scarce land. So, uh, what's the CCRC? What is that? Excuse me, a continuing care retirement community. It covers the gamut from independent living to assisted living to a skilled nursing facility. Excuse me. Would that be under new development? It, it would be under new development, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's a specific model. I didn't hear anything about assisted living or independent living, so I guess we will be better off. Judy, you want to conduct the survey, or how are we going to do this? Um, sure, stickers. Yes. Are we going to vote more than once? Are we... Frank? Well, you know, where I come from is, is that, you know, we're going to, going to need multiple approaches, and, and, um, and so it's artificial to say to vote for one, mm -hmm. but but I think you know it's worthwhile to have a show of hands for those that seem kind of interesting enough to be worth pursuing. So you know some of you may say, well, we want other things. You may be interested in a variety of options. So, okay. Go for you. Development opportunities for the Mormon Church. Well, I think <laughs> what does development opportunities mean? New construction. New construction. Yes. There's, there's going to be some overlap. Yeah. But this is brand new construction and it's sizable amounts, not just a. I think also that's going to end up overlaying with zoning issues, quite honestly. So um, I think we have to look at look at both. It's also better use of space. The new construction, you can use the space more effective for special needs for all kinds of needs than when you go in and rehab it. So, I'm going to say that the group should also look at zoning issues in terms of uh, doing opportunities. CCRC or assisted living, yes. and so you've kind of got two. You've got one group studying the opportunities, and another really understanding what the different models are and some of the finances behind that. And then they, I mean, it seems that there are just two broad categories. To start it's probably with. a third. That's that's good. I think it's also a third in terms of the barriers. And, and then the barriers, yeah. I think that. But the barriers too. You have to understand what the barriers are related to e each side and each model. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say, Carol. My name is Kara Bruton, and I'm just filling in for the planning department director until we make a hire, which is going to be very soon. Um, and I'm panicked. I don't know if this was said earlier, but Fran Price is leaving us um, mid-August, and it's going to be a huge, huge loss for the town with all the work that she's done. But um, all I really wanted to say is that um, I think zoning is a tool. Let's not get bogged down in this. I mean, if, <coughs> what I need is a staff person. It's a political will for any of these. Pick it. <laughs> we can get you the staff. We can tell you how to do it. Don't worry about the how. Don't worry about the barriers. Just if you're willing to come to another meeting and focus on development opportunities, financial models, or maybe there's another, a third one, which is, you know, within your existing home, how to make your life better. I mean, 
just keep it easy. But what I need as a staff person is you all to say, this is what I want. So um, let's not get bogged down. Don't worry about zoning. That's the easy part. Are you going to vote for Pat as well when she goes? No, no, no. Yes, that's my normal job. Yes, and um, and Edab and Myers, one of the co-chairs on the Economic Development Board, and historically, you know, Bob Sparber, who was the school superintendent for decades, he was one of our co-chairs um, because commercial tax base, you know, does help support the schools. But even though it's not our core mission, they certainly overlap with what the housing board is doing because. Um, they are the same concerns. And they, so we would love to have a lot of our members use their development knowledge and experience to help. Okay, get that's great. Yeah. So we, we're down to three. So now development opportunities, models, and maybe in -home what? In-home models, in models, models and service models. Service, service, models. service models is the way to go. What? Right. All the health things talk about services. Yeah. But the social isolation of staying home is not, the research says it's really not helpful. That's what I learned from the April 7th event. But there are ways around that. Right. There are ways around to deal with that. But realistically, okay, it doesn't matter if you're either A, in a home, or B, very happy in an apartment community where you are in place. Okay? Try to move someone in their 80s. Okay, do you think anyone wants to move? I moved my parents to, I'm to Brookline not. in their 80s. I'm they had to. I'm dealing with it more. Right. Personally, I've dealt with it myself. But if I could have kept parents in place, they would have been extremely happy. Necessarily. They could have been isolated. Yeah. Right. But, and, and no, my right. parents are much better like off social. living around other people. And yeah. that's just, I go to a lot of support groups, and I just don't want to lose track of all the health benefits that we learned about from um, Pardon? Yeah, but uh, again, I think right now we need, I'd rather not narrow in that sense because I can give you examples of, of you know, a woman living in my community across the street who thrives because we have a cohesive block, right. we have block parties, and she likes that life and she can function that way very well and we not want to be in any of these communities and shouldn't have to be. So I don't want to rule out for those folks that opportunity. There are also opportunities of, I've seen two, uh, two senior women sharing a house. With but I don't think isolation. we have a policy for that. That's just creativity. Well, it's still, it's still it's fitting into the services. Right. Um, I know Ruth made the comment that the forum that was, it's, she so strongly believes that you don't really need, it's beyond looking at one transition that as we age, there may be variety of transitions that we need to make. And so in, in terms of what we're looking at, how do we have those, that selection of opportunities um, so that those transitions need to be of your own home through accessory um, uh, uses by you know, additional uh, help and uh, or your being an accessory given in your children's home. Right? And it's, it, it, that, this goes both ways. And, um, and the third was um, services to people um, in their homes or in, in their homes as well as within existing um, you know, within existing uh, Housing. Do you think, think that's a fourth? Well, I, that might be a fourth. I think one of one of the issues has to be understanding co-housing, mixed housing, the entrance fee model. The differences at, of all of those things in terms of financing. Yeah. What Doesn't kind of? Does that start with the site? Pardon? Does that start with the site? No, not well. Different sites may accommodate different uses differently, but we have to understand. I mean, I don't know um, what the minimum. Uh, we actually need to have been talking about this a little, certain uses are going to have to require, just because of the finances, are going to have to require more square footage than others, so they're not going to fit on some sites. But we have to understand what um, 
what the different criteria are for each of those those different models. So that's not service provision, that's housing models. Or development or finance models. That's something like that, yeah. So maybe there are four brands. Well, isn't the uh, service delivery just, uh, doesn't that deal with accommodation in the home, uh, bringing services yeah, into? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. That's, that's, that's I really see it as development opportunities, sort of enhanced service delivery, and uh, development finance models. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Is it appropriate for, given what Kara said about the, the, basically the advocacy that we do we need to be the technical experts in the financing models? Or is that the staff? Well, well we've, certainly, the staff. we've certainly failed to consider financing. And, and the, the, um, the two decades in which there was um, a fair volume of housing for elderly persons, uh, both low income and, and uh, middle, the um, uh, <coughs> 60s and 70s, and a little bit into the 80s. <coughs> Uh, but the federal programs have atrophied entirely. I don't know about uh, Massachusetts Housing, MHSA, which, which had a program. But absent that, um, um, that long-term, relatively low-interest uh, financing, these are very hard to build. Because you need, you need to build into them space that isn't necessarily rentable. You need to have, um, if it's going to be nice, you're going to have common rooms, you're going to have a library, you're going to have a Computer rooms, um, exercise, or exercise, space. exercise space. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to look at a model, you don't need to go very far. Uh, just on the Boston side of Cleveland Circle, in Wallingford Road, there's Jewish Community Housing for the Elderly. And that's a 711 um, unit campus that's built entirely with federal assistance for the first three parts, and then the first two parts, and then state assistance for the third. Uh, so we're that's a political action problem that we need to engage in and could actually start on the same level. Oh, yes. I can also help with financing models uh, because I actually do that for a living. So uh, mm -hmm. I can also I can get us resources uh, that we need to. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Financing development models. Yeah. yeah. We still got the three. <laughs> development opportunities. Well, what are you going to restate to your interest in that as something that is important and that maybe you'd like to work on? Mm -hmm. Show of hands, please, for development opportunities.
she has, I mean, it's, 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 we're not stopping anyone from doing more than one. Uh, is, there, is the sign up sheet going all the way around? Yes. Why don't people on the way out put one, two, or three next to their name in terms of interest so that we can sort of contact people? We just have three? We just have three. Okay. Yeah. But there's some other things that have been dropped. Not drop. We're just start. You know, this is starting a process. You know, as we sort of go through this, you know, we're going to find that there are gaps, um, and we can adapt. Well, I mean, I would I would like to suggest that we include existing rentals. See, there is so much rental property available in Brooklyn and in urban areas. That is a, you know, and that's combined with services. Yeah. And then we're talking about a purchase. A rental. 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 What, what, what are we talking about ultimately having someone that come in and buy that property and convert it? No, I think it's, it's dealing with. Or is it just a service model? Well, I think it's dealing with the current rental developers and working with them to provide rentals that are attractive to uh, seniors. And a lot of buildings is a certain number of units left for Section 8 housing. Maybe in rental buildings there could be a certain number of units for senior housing. I don't know. It's just a thought. Oh, we, we, can, Carol, we can add that into the service. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, we'll move back in contact to sort of get these committees uh, going. I have, a, I have an announcement. There was this lovely green pen that was going around. That's mine. Oh, it is yours. <laughs> <laughs>